From WAMU 88.5 at American University in Washington, welcome to the Kojo Nandi Show, connecting your neighborhood with the world. Later in the broadcast, why we may see the end of legal but potentially dangerous alternatives to marijuana. But first, have you ever thought about going green by going solar, putting solar panels on your roof to generate your own electricity? Residential solar energy is growing rapidly in the United States thanks to financial incentives at the local, state, and national level that dramatically reduce the cost of getting started. But as lawmakers grapple with gaping budget deficits, those dollars are increasingly in jeopardy. Last month, the D.C. City Council grabbed funds from a renewable energy incentive program to help close a city budget gap, leaving 50 district residents without the money they'd been promised to help pay for new solar panels. The shift comes at a time when oil prices are rising because of unrest in the Middle East and Africa, and more people are looking at solar power as a way to create jobs and reduce global climate change. Joining me to talk about the future of residential solar power is Christophe Toulou, Director of the District of Columbia Department of the Environment. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Kojo. Pleasure to be here. Good to have you. The district has a renewable energy incentive fund to help residents install renewable energy systems. Those could include wind and geothermal, but most have been solar. How does the incentive program work? Well, the incentive program uh, is established through an assessment on utility bills, both electric and, and gas. Uh, that money goes into a fund, uh, part of which uh, goes to supporting the renewable energy investment program. And that is where uh, we have been spending uh, money. Um, it's about three and a half million dollars to date uh, getting solar photovoltaic units on tops of houses. The fund, it's my understanding, reimburses participants for about a third of the cost of their solar energy system. Actually, that's the target. Uh, the uh, DC rebate, because the cost of these systems is going down, now represents close to 50%. It's about 45%, actually. And last month, as I mentioned earlier, the DC City Council pulled about a third of the money in that $2 million fund to help close a projected budget gap. Who was affected by the loss of those dollars? Well, a lot of folks. And these are first adopters. These are the risk takers. These are people very excited about having this technology as part of their energy mix. Um, and uh, most directly, in this case, about 51 people that had gotten a letter of approval of their applications from us uh, were uh, left wanting in terms of the rebates. About 50 people so That's far. Right. Um, where do they now turn? Well, we are, we are hearing their concerns uh, and very sen sensitive uh, to the, the concern that they've raised because they've gone through a process with us. There's an expectation a rebate will be forthcoming, and we want to make sure that we make them whole, uh, mostly because we think this is a terrific technology and we'd love to get that deployed everywhere in the city. In addition to grants, what tax breaks are available to help homeowners recoup some of the cost of installing solar, G solar energy systems. Frankly, it's one of the things I'm thinking about. Well, our rebate is a part of a mix uh, that create a very vibrant market uh, in district. Uh, part of that is a 30% tax credit at the federal level, and that's off the total cost of the installation. Uh, we also have a very active market in our region for what they call solar renewable energy credits. Uh, and you can sell those as someone who puts uh, this uh, facility on your roof. And um, uh, projecting out, that can be a fairly substantial, roughly a third, again, of the cost. Uh, our rebate at half, uh, add it up, and you're looking at something that gets uh, really close to 100% of the cost of putting these units on your house. Inviting callers to join this conversation at 800-433-8850. What would it take financially for you to consider installing a solar energy system at your home? 800-433-8850 or go to our website, kojoshow.org. You mentioned homeowners who install solar panels is... Um, they can sell clean energy credits to local utility companies. How does that work? Uh, the way it works is through uh, a law in di the district uh, that establishes a renewable portfolio standard. And so the energy providers in the city, Pepco and Washington Gas primarily, 
are required to make available to district uh, energy buyers a certain percentage of energy from renewable sources. Um, and that is ramping up towards a 20% target in the year 2020. So uh, in order to do that, they can purchase um, these credits from renewable energy app, uh, uh, installments basically anywhere through a fairly large region uh, that encompasses the Northeast and into the Midwest. Uh, and that can be solar, wind, geothermal, and, and other systems. One of the reasons I got interested was reading a Washington Post article highlighting a district couple who shaved 25% of their solar installation cost through trading those clean energy credits. They got a 30% federal tax deduction and a district grant that covered another 35%, so they ended up paying just 10% of the bill. It's what incentives can do. That's exactly what incentives can do, and... Uh, it is a conscious effort on our part to make sure that this industry gets off the ground here. Our hope is that the district uh, can back away from these rebates when this industry is well established in the market, is, is able to support uh, this uh, technology. It's a terrific opportunity to uh, keep the city, which is already at a leading edge in terms of renewable energy and energy use uh, wisdom in the country uh, at the head of the pack. Uh, and so we just need to make sure we time it right to make sure that these subsidies get the maximum bang. Christophe Tulu is director of the District of Columbia Department of the Environment. We're inviting your calls at 800-433-8850. How do you feel about the government paying part of the cost of getting residential solar energy systems up and running? 800-433-8850. Here is David in Silver Spring, Maryland. David, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, I think it's a, a great idea, and I'm talking about it's a good idea from a purely economic perspective. The way I look at it with the utilities and the fossil fuel industry is we're, we're all indentured servants, and we're going to be stuck that way until we take matters into our own hands. If you invest in solar, it's about a six-year break even. And after you've broken even, it sits there and prints money. You turn your your roof into an ATM. It's a fantastic way to reduce your dependency on sending money out of state and out of the city to utilities that are far off uh, in, in a way. So in addition to the green, it's just it makes good sense for the cities and the states to be uh, doing this and individuals. Well, if, you're a business, if you're a business, it's a two to five year break even. It's unbelievable. Well, in addition to the green, according to you, David, there's the green, because after breaking even after six years or so, you say it basically prints money. It sits there like an ATM and prints money for you, so there's yeah. that aspect yeah, of the green it, also. It, it, it depends on the state, and it depends on the sure. business, but basically I put solar on my house, and after six years, it's just gonna pr it's $2,000 a year just in, in my pocket. It's, it's amazing. Okay, David, thank you very much for your call. You too can call us. Do you have solar panels on your house, or do you know someone who does? You can tell us about the experience. Do you think further cuts in clean energy incentives are likely both in the district and elsewhere as local, state, and even national norm lawmakers struggle to balance their budgets? I, I think it's certainly something that's on the table. Uh, and in different jurisdictions, different decisions will be made. Uh, I think one of the things we have going for us here in the district is extremely progressive laws as it relates to energy use. Uh, and, and that includes uh, the first in the nation energy benchmarking requirements that uh, now are applying to public buildings um, and, and are now beginning to apply to, to folks in the, in the private sector. What we're doing is gathering information about energy use, making that transparent so the folks who are not using energy well will know about it. Uh, at the same time, the Public Service Commission is putting smart meters on everybody's home by the end of this calendar year. Uh, that will give each of us the information we need to know about our energy use. Uh, we have very progressive and very generous uh, weatherization programs. So whatever energy you're using, uh, we are providing you with the opportunity to weatherize your home and make that much more energy efficient. Then you can look at technologies like solar photovoltaics and decide uh, to what extent you would want to invest in that and how much of, uh, of a unit you would want to put on your house. In terms of what's happening at the national level, the U.S. House of Representatives is considering two provisions that would eliminate funding for Department of Energy loan guarantees for solar and other non-nuclear clean energy projects. 
that's a matter of concern to you? Uh, it is a concern. I think those loan guarantees would apply to massive projects, the sorts of things we wouldn't be able to deploy here in the district because we simply don't have the space. Uh, what we'd be most interested in seeing continue is the credit that individual homeowners can get for the uh, use of this technology. And as far as I know, that's uh, slated to, to go forward through 2016. Here is Anthony in Washington, D.C. Hi, Anthony. Hey, Coach, thanks for taking my call. Um, so real quick, uh, I understand that the um, D.C. Is, doesn't really have the money or says they don't really have the money to continue this particular program. But I think that, uh, you know, solar suffers uh, a problem with um, exposure all over this country. And I thought maybe D.C. could consider uh, sponsoring some homes uh, in the city. So instead of just having an incentive for many people, they can have an incentive for a few people and use that as a rallying um you know, cry for other people. Furthermore, um, have you guys considered moving the leasing, I'm sorry, moving uh, the monies you do have or may have in the future toward the leasing program? Because very few people are actually buying solar cells or solar systems anymore. They're going to to leasing. And that's way, basically what I was looking into as well, because I live in a newer home and, you know, the cost-benefit analysis is definitely not there for purchase, but it may be there uh, for leasing. Christoph? Uh, well, the, uh, the the leasing idea is a terrific concept, and we have several companies in the district that are um, uh, ramping up to do that. Uh, and actually, as it turns out, it may be that between the federal credit and the solar uh, recs that I've talked about, uh, there may be sufficient incentive and opportunity for all the players in this for those, uh, those um, uh, leasing programs to go forward. The way that works very quickly is a company will basically – uh, put the system on your home and will guarantee you a reduced utility bill uh, in return for being able to take the uh, renewable energy credits produced by your system uh, and selling those in the marketplace. It's a terrific system. It means that uh, you as a person who's putting a unit like this on your home have no upfront cost, but what you're able to enjoy uh, right away is the energy saving, the utility cost saving uh, that would uh, happen as a result of that, uh, at that technology. Hey, thank you very much for your call, Anthony, and I'm glad you brought that up because there are two types of solar energy systems that homeowners most often install, either to heat water or to generate power. How do they work? Well, the generating power one is the one that we have been working uh, mostly to inspire, and that is solar cells on the roof that actually directly translate sunlight into electricity, uh, and that can offset uh, roughly about 30% of a typical home's energy uh, electric use um, uh, so that's a, a terrific advantage. Something that is, has a much quicker return on investment is what we call solar thermal, using the heat of the sun to heat up the water. Uh, that means that you don't have to use gas uh, or electricity, whatever you happen to have in your home, uh, to heat that water. And that's a terrific opportunity, particularly in places like Ward 7 and 8, where you have a lot of, of, uh, of gas use. Uh, not so much the electricity, but a lot of gas use. Uh, for heating water, and that can uh, save folks a lot of money. In the District of Columbia, you're also working on more ways to encourage people to go green with solar energy. What if someone does not have a big enough roof for solar panels? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, uh, question. And actually, if you have a, a single-family home, chances are you've got enough room for some solar deployment. There are other issues. You may be shaded by another building or have a big tree uh, that may compromise your ability. One of the things the advocates are, are looking for and that we're certainly taking a serious look at is uh, establishing what are called solar farms and creating the opportunity for homeowners that cannot put a uh, facility on their home to invest along with their neighbors in a uh, solar um, application on, say, the top of a nearby bank or some other building so that everybody can buy in, everybody can benefit, but they don't necessarily have to do this on their own house. An adjoining building, a nearby park, or you can invest in a community farm of solar energy. Exactly right. Here is Harvey in Alexandria, Virginia. Harvey, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Thanks for taking my call. I'm curious, with all of the uh, income potential that, uh, that these are generating, uh, at what point does, do, does oil price have to rise for these government incentives to no longer be necessary, for it to be cost-effective for the individual to just do it without government help? Good question. Yeah, and I think the answer to that is uh, a, a twofer. Uh, one is the cost of these systems is dropping dramatically. Uh, in 2009, um, it was about uh, $10 per watt. 
Uh, we're now down to $6 a watt, and that's installed. Uh, so uh, we're seeing a dramatic reduction in the cost of these systems. Uh, so we don't know for sure where the break-even point will be, where the market itself is going to sust sustain a robust program. What that enables us to do in the district is think about how we might tailor rebates that we might be providing in the future uh, to get this technology to people who um, uh, would need the most help, uh, don't have the income to, to invest in these, uh, these uh, systems otherwise. Harvey, thank you very much for your call. We move on to Dan in Silver Spring, Maryland. Dan, your turn. Hi, Kojo. How are you? Uh, I had this question. Uh, if I'm residing in outside of D.C., uh, still that uh, solar panels available for us, and my other part of the question is, if it is thus, uh, like a regular customer that have a other kind of electricity such as uh, PEPCO or BGE, uh, what would be the initial cost for install a solar panel? The initial cost for installing solar panels? Uh, a typical uh, solar panel system in the district uh, is one that would produce about uh, four kilowatts of power, and that's about a $24,000 proposition. Uh, we, our program isn't going to support uh, the, the development of that system in houses outside the district, obviously. Uh, but the uh, neighboring jurisdictions, Maryland in particular, has a program. Uh, it's nowhere near as generous as the, as the uh, rebate that's available in the district. Um, but uh, those costs are, are coming down. And for, uh, as I mentioned, for an average home in this area, uh, you're talking about a twenty to $24,000 proposition. Dan, thank you for your call. Here is a tweet we got from someone who says, for those of us far down on the Renewable Energy Incentive Program waitlist number 280, will we ever be able to get solar funding? And if so, when? Uh, the answer to that is uh, not certain. Uh, but my uh, sense is, is that this is a program that will continue on in some form as we assess over time uh, the role that the district can best play in moving this, this uh, technology forward. Uh, let me clarify just a little bit. The law that established the Renewable Energy in Investment Program is, uh, is slated to end at the end of fiscal year 2012. So that will be September 30th, 2012. And uh, so at that point, the responsibility for moving renewable programs will have shifted over to another entity that we are just now creating called the Sustainable Energy Utility. And among its jobs is to reduce per capita energy use among all district citizens uh, every year, uh, both electric and, and gas use. And these renewable technologies, uh, including solar, solar photovoltaics, solar thermal, geothermal, and others, uh, will be certainly part of a mix. And I suspect through the solar energy, uh, the sustainable energy utility, uh, there will be um, support for folks who are looking to deploy those technologies. How does the district as a whole benefit from the investment it's making in residential solar energy? Well, the district as a whole benefits. Uh, the, the big picture is uh, we as a city are almost at this point totally dependent on energy resources that come from outside the city. Uh, a lot of that is coal-fueled uh, uh, electricity, uh, so we're, we're dependent on the price of that fuel. We're dependent on the reliab reliability of the system that gets that energy to us. And really the benefit here is to create uh, a market and a generation capacity for energy in the district uh, that will help us be less dependent on those outside sources. And by deploying these kinds of technologies, we also reduce the amount of greenhouse gas that's produced. We do our part uh, to keep climate change uh, at bay. Here is Lisa in Fairfax, Virginia. Lisa, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi. I just wanted to start out by saying I'm, I am pro-solar and pro-credit, but I'm concerned about the environmental impact of the manufacturing process of these solar cells and, you know, where are we getting the cells from, Is where are the different companies in the, dist in the district procuring their cells. Um, there was an article in the New York Times about a year ago that detailed um, how toxic the process is and that the cells that we're getting from China, which are all maybe much cheaper to purchase, have um, disastrous environmental impact because the manufacturing sites aren't recycling um, the, the byproducts of the process properly. And that's a very legitimate concern. It's something that folks uh, should be thinking about. Uh, it is a conundrum for us because, <clears throat> excuse me, most of the 
uh, most of the solar systems that are deployed in this country are unfortunately not built here. And uh, there are environmental consequences of the production of some of these systems, some more so than others, uh, and some systems, uh, depending on where they're built and what technology is being used, uh, more than others. Uh, I think one of the key things here is that in addressing our renewable energy interests, that we create a market that's sufficient for us to take the next step and consider the sourcing and consider uh, whether or not we can actually develop a viable domestic uh, source of, of these panels uh, so that we can have the kinds of environmental controls and considerations at play that, uh, that we do in this country. And finally, there's Hassan in Washington, D.C. Hassan, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, Kojo. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for, take, uh, thank, thank you for telling me, uh, taking my call. I'm interested in uh, a contact person that I can go. I live in the District of, of Columbia. Uh, the second one is uh, I have a vending truck that sells uh, food, and I saw someone that has a solar system on the roof of the truck, and I'm interested in doing that. How could I do that? I'm not. I'm pretty ignorant about solar systems. Can you please help? Christoph Tulu probably just needs a contact number to get more information or a website to go to. Actually, uh, and what I would suggest is checking with us at our website at www.ddoe. Uh, .dc.gov. Uh, again, ddoe.dc.gov. Uh, and we have a lot of information, preliminary information that may help you with some of your questions. Uh, if you need more help, there's contact information there, and we'll be glad to help you. Christophe Toulou is director of the District of Columbia Department of the Environment. Thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to talking to you in the future to see what progress is being made because it looks as if residential solar power is on the upswing across the nation. It sure is, and thank you very much.